Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about equations. Now equations and solving equations is an ancient art form. Maybe you could refer to it as an ancient science or mathematical form instead. But the idea was that if you posed a question such as what are two numbers that if I multiplied them together I would get 100 but if I added them together I would get 52. Those were questions that were all around the ancient world. And in fact, they were so prevalent and so common that they popped up all across the earth in different areas. Maybe because they, they held some practical aspects as well, right? For example, if I have a, a bag of rice that is selling for a dollar a pound and I bring in 2.3 pounds, how much would I need to charge? What if instead of a dollar a pound, it was $1.38? These are scalable proportions that we would normally just handle with straight through computations. But now let's imagine that instead of having a direct comparison, I was working on a number of comparisons. Maybe I was trading bags of rice for sheep. Maybe I had a multiplier that was causing me to be plentiful this year from my harvest. And I was trying to bring that in and estimate how much money I would earn and how I could turn the money I would earn into. As you begin to develop these ideas and backtrack the logic to figure out how much you would possibly need to sell that bag of rice for, you very much naturally develop algebra. And algebra, if you look at its roots within the word, was about trying to fill in the, the gaps in computations. Today we're gonna to be playing around with solving equations in which we have the details we would need and we're just simply trying to act as the detective and backtrack through to say, what is that linchpin? What is that key number or key solution that makes this entire statement possible? So let's go ahead and take a look at an example for this one. I believe we might've started this one last time, but nonetheless, let's go ahead and start with just doing a quick little walkthrough of it. So we have up at the top here, an equation. That equation is three times X minus six minus X equals four minus the quantity X plus one. And you can sometimes say that out loud if you're ever trying to talk about equations uh, over the phone or via audio is you can use the word quantity to talk about whenever you're using parentheses. So we've got three times the quantity X minus six minus X equals four minus the quantity X plus one. Now let's go ahead and take a moment and see if we can represent that with pictures. We've been using these uh, X squares and X, we'll cut, maybe call those X logs, right? They've, they've got uh, a height of one and they've got a width of X, which gets you an area of X. Here we've got a width of X and a height of X that gets you X squared. And you can think of these as piles, right? These, these, these amounts, these quantities that we said numbers can help represent. And to just balance those off, we're gonna have these shaded in shapes be the holes, which are just kind of the opposite, the deficit, the, 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 entity that if you were to combine it with a pile would zero out. So let's try to represent this as uh, shapes. We have three X minus sixes. Okay, well, I know what X is. X is gonna be one of those lines. And then I'm taking away six. So that would be as if I was taking away um, six of those unit blocks. That's gonna get very cumbersome. So I'm gonna go ahead and write it as like a, a six, or you could think of it as being plus one of these holes, one of these shaded in uh, blocks and six of those little unit blocks. So we have X minus six, uh, which we have right here, and then we're gonna have three of those. So we can think of repeating that three times. And now I've got minus X. So minus X we know is gonna be one of those, those shaded in kind of X rectangles. Okay, and so that's gonna be the entire left-hand side of my equation. Now, I am claiming that that is equal to a bunch of things on the right-hand side. Perhaps a nice way of thinking about this is to think about it in terms of scales. If you're trying to measure that bag of rice and compare it to gold coins, for example, or, or some other kind of, of measurement, you would have a scale. And on one side of the scale, you would put down your item. Uh, perhaps we would put down our little bag of rice. And then on the other end of the scale, you would put down something it was equivalent to. So maybe this would be uh, gold bricks or something like that. 
and they would be equal or balance or equivalent when you're talking about uh, a perfect kind of symmetry between these two shapes. So on the left-hand side now, we've drawn all of the shapes for the left-hand side of our equation. We now claim that it is equal to the one on the right-hand side. So the right-hand side would be four. So I'm gonna have four of those unit blocks or you just do one unit block and put a number four in it like I did for the six. And then we have minus x plus one. So minus the quantity x plus one. And you can think of that as being, how do I minus a quantity? Well, that's the opposite. That's, that's saying doing the opposite of x plus one. So the x plus one, this would have been the x. Uh, the opposite of it would have been shaded in. And then the plus one would have been this. And we have the opposite of that, which would be shaded in. Okay, wonderful. And we're claiming that everything above this line and everything below this line are equivalent. Well, if I wanted to try to figure out what this mystery value of X is that would cause this entire statement to be true, I would begin taking things off of both sides of the scale until I hopefully had an X on one side and then I had something that it was equivalent to on the other hand, on the other side. That way I would be able to say that one X measures out and then by adding more X's and mad adding more of what it's equivalent to on the other end of the scale, we would have perfect balance. That becomes difficult to do when you're talking about all of these shapes. So this is where we really start to shift into the art of algebra and say, let's represent this more with our notation. So we start with exactly what we have at the top, three times X minus six minus X equals four times negative x plus one. And we got to keep that in a quantity. So let's keep that in parentheses here. Good. Now, if I have three x minus sixes and I look back over here at my picture, that means that I have three x's and three negative sixes. Okay, so that's gonna be three x's and three negative sixes. That'd be a total of 18 negative unit blocks is another way for me to write the exact same meaning as I had on the left hand side. Then over here, I have four of these unit blocks. So I'm going to keep that. And then I have the opposite of an X and the opposite of a unit block. So it's going to be the opposite X and the opposite of a unit block. Okay, great. What can we perhaps see? Um, I do recognize that I have an X block on the right hand side and I have a X block on the left hand side. There's no reason why if I take those off my scale, I shouldn't keep balance. So let's go ahead and take those off. And then that would be as if I had taken away this from my equation and this from my equation. Now here you can think of how you would take off a, a hole, these little negative blocks, in a couple of different ways. Um, algebraically, we're going to start with doing what's called the inverse. We're gonna be using the inverse or the opposite of the, uh, of the action of the operation in order to cancel it away. And so what I'm gonna be writing, instead of just underlining these and taking these away, is I'm gonna be putting a little notation like plus X. So this is gonna be the method by which I am taking it away. So I'm taking away a hole, a negative X, uh, from both sides by adding X to both sides, adding a pile to both sides. That hole in the pile is gonna zero out, so it's gonna be leaving me with everything else. So this is an optional step. It's one that I do encourage because it's gonna help get you practice with those inverses. We're doing the opposite of it. Okay, excellent. Uh, what else can we have? Um, Oh, look at the right hand side, I have four minus one. And, and in my picture, that'd be as if I had four of these piles and I had a, a, a negative one unit block, which is gonna be your hole. So I'm gonna be combining piles and holes and that gets me to three if I was to combine them all together. It's the, the equivalent of saying that I just have a net of three. Okay, great, three X uh, minus 18. Now take a moment and stop and look at the meaning of this phrase. What this phrase means is that if I have three of these X blocks and I take away 18 units from it, that I will be left with a total of three. So it's almost like saying I need to have my three X's be worth three more than 18. So that when I have three X and I take 18 away with it, I'm left with three. Let's see how we could play that out in our algebra. Well, if I know that 3x has to be 18 more than 3. This is where that inverse idea really helps us kind of see the connections and the patterns. We could add 18 to both sides, and that's telling me that 3x has to be 18 larger than the number 3, which would be the number 21. Okay, nice. Now I've got 3x equals 21. That means three of these x blocks 
are the same as 21 unit blocks? Well, I would I would really prefer to just know what one of those X blocks would be. Well, that would be that would be a third of my 21. So again, we can see these inverse ideas of saying I have three times X. Let's do the inverse of that. That'd be division. Let's do it to both sides so that we keep our scale balanced. And at the very end, I'm going to see that I have X is equal to seven. Now, the important step is to go back and to double check this, because once you've kind of run, run through this logic, the problem with doing this, this kind of chain of logic that we had to do in order to solve this problem is that if we made a mistake anywhere along the way, it really could have thrown off our course. So now let's go and let's, let's check our original answer. So we have three, X minus six was our original question, but now I know that we think that that's gonna be a seven. So three, seven minus six, so three times the quantity seven minus six minus seven is equal to four minus the quantity seven plus one. Okay, let's try to work that through. Well, now instead of trying to undo all these operations, I can just put this in my calculator. I can do things directly. I can follow the order of operations. Order of operations says that we have parentheses first. Okay, let's do parentheses on both sides. Seven minus six would be one. So now I have three times one minus seven. And on the right-hand side, I'd have parentheses first. That'd be four minus eight. Okay, so far so good. Uh, let's see what we can do then. Next would be, according to order of operations, the multiplication and division. On the left-hand side, that's gonna be three times one. That'll just be three. So I'll say three minus seven is equal to four minus eight. And now we're left with the addition and subtraction layer, which is the same thing whether you consider negatives or consider positives. So let's go ahead and just do uh, what we see in front of us. Three minus seven or three and then adding seven negative blocks is gonna get me a result of four negative blocks or four holes. And then on the right hand side, four minus eight, again, is gonna get you that negative four. So this checks out. Now, I will say that the reason why I insist that we check our answer is for two reasons. One, keep in mind what we're all practicing for. If, if you're practicing for a career, especially a highly technical career, you will be the only person who is in charge of getting correct answers for a problem that is in front of you. Yes, there'll be some opportunity for others to check your work. Yes, there'll be some opportunity for you to have computers assist you. But for the most part, if a company or your employer knew how to solve a problem, they probably wouldn't have hired you. So you are going to be the fallback resource expert. And so when you're trying to work through some of these lo this logic, it's incredibly helpful to make sure that the answer you're giving is right and that you take the little bit of time to double check your answer. The other reason is that it helps to reduce a lot of your test anxiety. I will say that one of the most frustrating things for me after I take a test is not knowing the score that I got. And so especially in algebra or in math classes in general, I would go through tests and I would take the test and I would get all the answers. And if I had any time left over, I would go back and I would double check each one of my answers back in the original problem. That was how I was able to recognize that some of my answers didn't work. And that way, instead of trying to do everything all over again, I could go back and just fix the errors I had made. Okay, so just a couple of different tricks there, one professional and one academic. All right, let's take a look at this problem right here. So in this problem, what we see is that we now have some fractions. Fractions can make things a little bit more complicated, but I'm gonna have to walk us through this. I'm gonna use some colors to really help us through. Um, the first thing you're gonna wanna think about is that when you're talking about fractions, uh, rectangles, squares, sizes, all of these, our pictures really start to become a little bit cumbersome. And I'm gonna show you what we mean. If I'm talking about having one third of one minus X, the quantity one minus X, that means I've got a pile. I've got a pile that's one minus X and I'm trying to do that into thirds. Um, that, that's a little bit challenging. So I'll tell you how we're gonna write that. We're gonna go ahead and write that as if we had a circle and we're gonna break the circle into thirds. So we're gonna go ahead and write that here as if I have uh, a one minus X pile, one minus X, and I just have one third of that circle. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw that in uh, as if I have just one third of that circle. There we go. So I've got my one third of my one minus X, and now on the other hand side, I have uh, the opposite of X plus one divided into halves or divided into two. Um, let's see. So let's go ahead and draw that maybe with another picture. So now I'm gonna be taking away uh, a half of a pile. There's my half. 
and I want to make sure that I'm labeling these now because the sizes aren't really aren't really working for us in this picture. The picture is starting to fall a little flat. But I'm trying to take away that. So I've got the opposite of this half here. And then that's going to be equal to a negative 2. So two of these little unit blocks. I'm just going to keep that as negative 2 for right now. Okay. Imagine again the scales. We're trying to maintain balance. We're trying to look at what we can compare. Uh, the nice parallel I might think for this one is imagine if we were trying to figure out how many gold bricks go with a bag of rice and somebody had brought in half a bag of rice. I, I, I don't want to cut up my gold brick. I don't want to be trying to, to compare these things by, by without being perfect. So maybe I would add more to one part of the scale in order to balance it out with the other part of the scale. Um, how could we do that? I can, I'm going to say right now, it's already looking like it's going to be easier to uh, try to add back the, the, um, the missing half, but I, I kind of need to, to add the entire left-hand side of the scale, right? So whatever we're putting on the left-hand side of the scale, if over here is all my rice and this is my gold, uh, I don't want to be mixing my gold and rice. I want to keep one on one side, one on the other. Uh, let's just try let's just try doubling up. Let's try putting the exact same thing on both sides. So now I'm going to be adding uh, another third of this one minus x amount. So this is my one minus x amount. I'm going to add a third of that. Uh, I'm going to add uh, another half of this this pi right here, this x plus one. Um, but I need to add the same thing. So I actually need to add the opposite. I need to add a negative version of that. Uh, and then on the right hand side, I'm going to add in negative two. Okay. So we can, you can think of it as the plus the negative. I'm just going to say that what I'm doing is I'm keeping the scale balance because if I put the exact same things on the left hand side and the exact same things on the right hand side, I should have a balanced scale. Okay. So what's that going to get us? Um, after we do all of that, I should be left with two of these thirds which i guess in pictures we could probably draw out as saying that i had one third and then i just finished adding another third that's great and on the right hand side i have two of these half opposites two of these opposite halves so that would be enough to complete my circle my amount and say that i now have a an x plus one or the opposite of an x plus one amount uh, on the right hand side, I would have four negative unit blocks. Okay. So it feels a little bit weird, but right now all we're saying is that it's possible for me to not only add numbers to the left hand side or, or, or numbers to the right hand side, but what I could really do is add this equation to itself, which is a little bit weird when we take it away from the pictures, but with the pictures, it makes sense. I could add another half bag of rice to the left-hand side, and then I could balance that out with, with the exact same amount of gold on the right-hand side, and that ratio should always stay the same. That, that equivalence should always stay the same. Okay, so I've almost got out of the fraction land, except that right now, this is still in fractions. This one is not. So now I would want to try to add in probably the exact same thing, and then close up this second pi. So if I added in another third, that should get me a total pi for the one minus x amount. Uh, on the right hand one, what do we have now? Uh, we should have another half that we just added. Oh, and we're back into fraction land. That's, that's a little upsetting. So we, it's almost like we got one of these fully into a, a whole shape and then the other one is just bouncing right back out. How many times do we think it's going to take uh, for us to repeat this process for us to be able to fill in both of these circles? So I've got thirds here. I've got halves here. How many times do I have to do the same thing uh, to one side and the other in order to get balance? I'm going to leave you with that question for a moment. Okay, great. Here's, here's what I'm gonna claim here. I'm gonna walk you through my logic for this. What I think is it's going to have to be six times. And I see that because uh, I think we've gotten to the halfway mark with this one. And this one took us three times. I had to add it, um, I, had, I had one here. I had the second one on this row. By the third piece, I had filled up the entire left-hand side, um, but I had, a hanging over half unit. If I repeated this process again, 
I would essentially have two of these pies and three of these over here. This can become difficult for us to see without working in the algebra, so now we're gonna jump over into the algebra. So this is sometimes what's referred to as multiplying by the uh, least common multiple. And if we break down that word, least common multiple just means the smallest shared thing I can multiply to. So let's see exactly what that is. Uh, I have the exact same problem that I started with, x plus one over two equals negative two. Now, if I think it's going to take me six times, and I see that because six is something that I could get to from thirds, and it's something I could get to from halves, right? So the three can multiply up to six, and the two can multiply up to six, and I think that's going to be the least amount that I have. Well, we could do this entire process six times for the left part of the scale, and this entire process six times on the right part of the scale. All right, so let's do that. If I have six thirds, how many totals would that be? Uh, that would be two totals. Six thirds would make two totals. And you could see that if we wrote that out algebraically, because if I have six thirds of my one minus X, and then over here, I'd have six of these halves. So this would be six halves of my X plus one. Good. So I've done six things on the left-hand side of the scale. I need to do six things on the right-hand side of the scale. If I have six negative twos, that would be a total of negative 12. So take a moment and recognize what we did there and you can add this into your notes. Maybe use a different color. You can say that what I've done is I've multiplied the entire side, entire left-hand side and the entire right-hand side by six. And what that means in pictures is that I'm just doing and doing and repeatedly doing uh, this, this addition to uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side based on the scale I was told was originally balanced. Okay, let's see why we would have wanted to do that. Well, six divided by three is two, and so that's exactly what we would have thought we'd see when we repeated this process, right? Is that if we had done this a total of six more times, or a total of six times, that we would have had six thirds over here, uh, which I'll sketch out real quick. So there's three thirds, that would have been the other three thirds, so I've been a total of two whole amounts. And then the right hand side, if we had done that again, we would have had uh, one whole, two holes, and then three whole amounts. So that would have been uh, what well, we'll see in just a moment. So I have one, two whole amounts, two of these one minus x whole amounts, and then I have three of these x plus one amounts. And I'm keeping the negatives along, along for the ride so that I make sure that I'm talking about the opposite or, or the original. Excellent. Um, from here, we can maybe recognize we have our distribution property, right? So I have two of these one minus x's. That means I have two ones and I have two opposites of x. That'd be two and then the opposite of two x's. This would be then a minus three x and this would be the opposite of three unit blocks. And on the right hand side, I have negative 12. Oh, well, two piles and three holes would give us the equivalent of saying I just had one hole left over. Uh, two opposites of x and three opposites of x gives us five opposites of x. And that leaves us with negative 12 on the right hand side. Why would I keep uh, a pile on the left hand side if I also had 12 of those piles or on the right hand side or rather why would I keep one of the holes on the left hand side if I had 12 of those holes on the right hand side uh, we could take one of those away uh, we could fill it in let's fill it in that would leave me with negative 5x equaling negative 11 so that would mean that each of those x's would have to be a fifth of that amount so it would have to be uh, 11 fifths and notice that the negatives drop because if I have the opposite of five X's gets me the opposite of five units, then I must have started from a place that was positive in both sides. You can think of these however you'd like, just make sure that your notation communicates your model. So we think that X is equal to 11 fifths. Let's, let's give that a test. We need to double check the answer because there's so much that could have gone wrong here. There's so many negative signs, there's so many parentheticals, there's so many X's or not X's. Let's, let's make sure that after we've done all of this, it wasn't wasted effort. Uh, I'll let you know that when I was doing this for practice off camera, I completely messed this one up and I think I messed it up like maybe twice. These are not easy problems. These are problems that you really want to uh, be methodical about. You want to find the best way to notate them and sometimes you're going to have to start all over again and, and try to be more organized in your work. It's just part of the journey. It's, it's almost like... Um, Oh, you know, some battles are just, they're, they're not worth worth 
conquering if you're not allowed to to struggle a little bit in the process it makes the reward a little bit sweeter so we have 11 fifths let's see if all of that work all of that logic really came to be all right one third multiplied by one minus 11 fifths i'm just copying the original problem and instead of x i'm putting in what we hypothesize x will be so we've got now 11 fifths plus one over two equaling negative two okay so i have a whole well, i've got well, i've got one third of a whole pile taking away 11 fifths of a pile that that seems like a lot um i i'm probably want to stop talking about these as apples and oranges let's see if we can get these common so instead of one whole let's break that into fifths so i have one third uh five fifths would make that whole and i'm taking away 11 of those fifths i'm good with that logic uh minus i have let's see what would that be 11 fifths and then i'm adding one pile to it okay so i have 11 fifths and i'm adding well again five fifths to that right so 11 fifths uh, and i could break that one whole amount into five fifths okay divided by two equaling negative two so i'm just working again uh, order of operations going inside the parentheses out uh one third would carry through inside the parentheses five fifths minus 11 fifths would be as if i had five things and i've taken 11 things away that would be leaving me a deficit of six of those things so six fifths okay great i have 11 fifths uh, and I'm adding five fifths to it. That would be 16 fifths total right now. Great. And again, if you ever forget what the negative sign can do or where to move it, just think about the what the meaning is. This is the opposite of the combination of 11 and five fifths divided by two. So we're gonna do the opposite. We're maybe gonna do all of that meaning and then we'll take care of the opposite uh, action later. Okay, let's keep going. I now am multiplying these these fractions what does that mean again well if i have one third times uh negative six over five we can think of that as being uh, a third of six fifths well if i break all of my fifths into thirds there should be 15 of them total so that would be uh six fifteenths made opposite now okay that's looking good Similarly for the other one, if I have 16 fifths divided by two, that means I have my fifths and I'm breaking those into halves. So now I should have tenths. So that'd be 16 over 10 equals negative two. Okay, we should be, we should be doing pretty okay here. Okay, uh, how can I combine these? Um, Oh, well, the exact same way that we had just done above. If I'm trying to combine fractions, I probably want to get the denominators the same. And so I could think of what is the, the scaling I could do to both sides so that I get them to be uh, apples and apples. Uh, for example, right now I have a 15th. I could think of saying that if I have 15 and I was trying to, to add more of those to the left-hand side, I, I might want to think of those in terms of 30ths. That would, be, that would be the next way that I could evenly split my 15ths. Okay, so 6... 15 so that'd be the same as doubling the top and doubling the bottom that'd be negative 12 thirtieths if that feels a little bit weird let's think about it this way you can always adjust fractions so long as they have the same meaning so if you wanted to uh, make the bottom the number 15 go up by multiplying by two you would just simply need to do that to the top because when you do things to the top of a fraction, that means multiplication. And when you do things to the bottom of the fraction, that means division. So by multiplying by the top by two and multiplying the bottom by two, you're really doing nothing at all, except for changing your perspective on what that fraction uh, could be represented as. Okay, so we have negative 12. And then we have uh, this other one, we would probably need to bring it from 10 up to 30. So that would be multiplying the top and bottom by three. So it'd be 30. And then if 16 times three would be what, 32, 48, I think it's 48. Oh, I sure hope we did all of our work, math work. We're gonna see right, just a little bit if we did it all right. Okay, so we've got this. Um, okay, so now I have negative 12 thirtieths and negative 48 thirtieths. Um, well, that'd be 12 and 48 more of these opposites. So that'd be a total of 60 of these opposites. Okay, so now I've got 60 opposites broken into 30 parts is equal to two opposites. And I think we're looking pretty good. 60 divided by 30, uh, that would be two pieces for each of those 30. 
So I have negative two is equal to negative two. And we have proven that yes, our hypothesis was correct. All of our work that we had done originally is true. We have found a number that works to balance this equation. Oh, that one's a rough one. So let's take a moment and think, is it possible that there is more than one number that makes this true? Um, I'm going to argue no, but uh, I'll leave it to you to kind of think about why that might be. Look through up here at the original problem and think about, is there another number that, that could have been plugged in here, how it might have worked through? Um, if I had a, a negative, let's say instead, uh, would one minus a negative have been different than one minus a positive? Uh, would negatives and positives have played nicely together? If I had made uh, the number very large or I'd made it a little bit smaller, would it have worked? We're gonna find a way in a later section to really show you uh, visually how it is that there's only one of these solutions. But for right now, just kind of maybe roll through a couple of numbers that you could plug into this original equation in your mind and think to yourself, would they have worked? Why, why do I think they might not have worked? Okay, share your thoughts after this. Okay, so let's now move on to our next problem. Now, at this point, we should start to recognize that using pictures is a helpful aid for getting us started in our model of logic. But after a certain point of difficulty, uh, they really become a little bit more cumbersome than they become helpful. So this is a great place to think about how can we move away from the pictures argument and, and just use that model of logic that we've spent so long developing. Solve, ooh, a lot of decimals. Solve 0 0.1 times y minus two plus 0 0.03 times y, that, that's a lot. Okay, um, here's what I will suggest we do. If you recall, back when we were first learning in elementary school how to read these numbers, we spent a lot of time memorizing what each of the decimal places were. And I'm gonna argue that it wasn't about memorizing for the sake of memorizing, it actually holds a lot of meaning that's gonna help us right here. If I wanted to read this first number, 0 0.1, I could read it as 0 0.1, or I could read this off as 1 tenth, right? It's in the tenths place. That tenth, is what allows us to turn this into a fraction. So 0 0.1 can actually be written as a fraction, 1 tenth, just the same way that we would read it. So we have 1 tenth y minus 2 plus, ooh, how would we re read this one? Uh, it's not in the tenths place, it's in the tenths, then the hundredths place, this is 3 hundredths, plus 3 hundredths y minus 4. And then we have 0 0.02, that would be 2 hundredths, so it equals 2 hundredths times 10. I don't know about you, but I think this looks a lot more relatable, especially after we did that last problem. Because now I have a lot of fractions and I can think about again, if I treat this like a scale, how could I balance the left-hand side of the scale with the right-hand side of the scale? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna need to pile on quite a bit to, to both sides because I've got all of these parts, all these fractions affecting me. Um, how many how many times am I gonna have to pile things onto the left or onto the right? Well, we can again look at uh, the denominators, right? The exact same way that we were doing back before, where we said after we'd gone through all of this work, we identified that we could, we could use the number six, right? We could use the number six because six came from three and it came from two. I'm gonna argue that we could do the exact same logic with this one. I just need to find a number that I could scale the number 10 up to and the number 100 up to. Now we could scale the number 100 up and the number 10, up. I'm gonna argue that the number 100 is actually the best uh, least common multiple between these two. I can scale 10 up to 100 and I can leave 100 exactly how it is and I should have the, the exact same denominators for all of these parts together. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's try that. Um, let's see what happens if just like our model above, we use our least common multiple, which is 100, and we multiply everything on the right-hand side and everything on the left-hand side by this 100. And keep in mind that for our pictures, what this just means is it's, it's as if I'm piling the exact same thing up on top of itself 100 times, so my scale should remain balanced. All right, so I now have a 100 tenths of this y minus two. A uh, hundred tenths would be 10 wholes, so that would be 10. So okay, that's gonna be 10 of these y minus twos. Good. And then if I had a hundred of these three hundredths, 
uh, that would be one hundredth, uh, a hundred times would get me uh, a hole, and so I have three of those. That would give me three total uh, holes. So three y minus fours. If you find that while working through this, it's difficult to keep track of what you're doing, you can draw all over your page and make this notation because notice that this is nothing more than distribution. You can write some arrows here that says I just affected this first term. Now I'm about to affect this second term with my multiplication. Okay, so now I've got equals and then I have, uh, let's see, two hundredths uh, times a hundred. So that would be two holes. And then I would say times 10. Now this might feel a little weird. Why are we not multiplying the 10 by the 100? Because that's not the distribution. We have to again go back to the meaning. I have two hundredths 10 times over. So you could think of that as maybe being 20 hundredths combined. And so when you multiply that by 100, that'd be 20 whole units. That's where we get this 2 and 10 idea. So the same way of the same answer, the same meaning, just a different perspective of looking at it. So don't multiply the hundred in here twice. There's no addition or subtraction between these two terms to allow for you to do that distribution. It violates the meaning. Keep the meaning clear. Okay, what can we do from here? Uh, from here, it looks like just all the other problems we've been dealing with. Uh, we can multiply the 10 in to both the terms. There's addition and subtraction there. So that's our distribution law, 10 y uh, minus 20. Uh, then we have plus 3y minus 12. That came from doing 3y and minus 4. Um, and then I have equals 20. Perfect. Uh, I have some like terms. I have some like piles. I have 10 y's and 3 more y's. That's a total of 13 y's. Uh, I have 20 opposite blocks and another 12 opposite blocks. That's going to be 32 opposite blocks equals 20. Um, and then from there, I can just try to get all of my, my gold on the right-hand side and all of my, my rice on the left-hand side. So I've got uh, negative 32. I want to probably cancel that away, fill in all of that. Uh, and then I'll do that to the right-hand side as well. So I keep that scale balanced. That gets me 13y equals 52, uh, which should be... Okay, so that means each of these y's would need to be um, 52 over 13. Now we might think that this is the simplest, but if you actually try to simplify this in your calculator, you're gonna see that this can actually go all the way to saying y equals four. So for our most simplified answer, we will say y equals four. All right, let's go ahead and leave it there today. The main idea I want to you to take away with this is Keep in mind that whenever I say something is equivalent, it means that you could look at it one way or you could look at it the other way, but it's the exact same thing. And we can use a scale as a nice metaphor for saying that if I'm adding stuff to the left-hand side or I'm taking stuff away from the left-hand side, I have to do the exact same thing to the right-hand side. But even more so than that, I can actually take anything and put it on the left-hand side. And so long as I do the equivalent thing on the right-hand side, I remain balanced. So if I have my, my scale balanced in the beginning with an equation, I can double both sides of the equation. I can triple both sides of the equation. I could even break both sides into halves because I still have that relationship and the meaning staying the same.